Okay. So uh, talking about uh, sequences yesterday, not yesterday on on Wednesday. is a sequence and the definition of a convergent sequence was xk converges to x if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an n epsilon such that xk minus x is less than epsilon for all k greater than equal to and one of the question that was there were two questions I think one question by someone was that if you have only a finite number of items would that be called a sequence it turns out they are called sequences finite sequences but they are not studied at all because they are not so interesting. Uh, we always study infinite sequences. So these are infinite sequences and so infinite sequences are more interesting because there is there could be convergent behavior or there could be other kinds of behavior which we are going to study today. Uh, the second question that was raised is how do we know uh, if a sequence is convergent or not? Uh, how do we apply this particular definition? So let's try to apply this definition see if we are able to come up for a given epsilon greater than zero, we are able to come up with an n epsilon or not. So I'll come up with a bunch of examples. So let's say xk equals to one over k, xk equals to one over k square, xk equals to one over log of k. Uh, whenever I write log, it will always be base e. Uh, when I'm using base 10, I'll make it explicit that it is base 10 log. Okay, or maybe I should just use ln. That's much easier. Okay, so this is a natural log. So let's try to, what do you think this particular sequence converges to? If xk equals to one over k, what does this converge to? Zero. This one also converges to zero, this one also converges to zero. So let's try to see whether this claim that we have made that xk converges to zero, does it fit within this particular definition or not? So let's pick an epsilon greater than zero. So I want my xk minus x, well x is actually zero, should be less than epsilon, which means one over k should be less than epsilon which means k must be greater than one over epsilon. So let me pick n epsilon to be the ceiling of, sorry, one over epsilon. So this is the integer. So for every epsilon greater than zero, this probably is a going to be a not a natural number, so we have to take the ceiling function of it, so that becomes a natural number. And so every k greater than n epsilon will also be greater than 1 over epsilon, as a result of which xk minus 0 will be less than epsilon. Okay, so that's roughly the train of thought here. We can do the same thing here. Uh, I'll just jump to this particular step. 1 over k square is less than epsilon, which means k should be greater than 1 over square root of epsilon. So I'm going to pick my n epsilon as 1 over ceiling, ceiling of 1 over square root of epsilon. Any questions so far? I think it's fairly straightforward. We can do the same thing here. 1 over log of k is less than epsilon, which means k should be greater than 
well, log of k should be greater than 1 over epsilon. Let me take it one step further. So exponential is an increasing function, right? So I can take exponential if a is greater than b, then exponential of a is greater than exponential of b, right? Because both sides are positive numbers. So I can say k is greater than, so I'm going to pick my n epsilon as Okay, so in all these three examples, for every epsilon greater than zero, I have demonstrated that there is an n epsilon such that xk minus x is always less than epsilon for all k greater than or equal to n epsilon. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So let's move on to another definition of a special type of sequences known as Cauchy sequence. xk is a Cauchy sequence if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists an n epsilon in natural number n such that, I'll write it here, I'm going to erase this side. xk minus xm is less than epsilon for all km greater than or equal to n epsilon. What is, yeah? Capital N epsilon is just a natural number. It's a natural number so that if you look at the sequence beyond that natural number, uh, this particular condition will hold true. So let's. I have a sequence. Okay, so I have some oscillating sequence. This is my x1, x2, so this is my r, this is my n, this is x3, x4, x5. So you can imagine that this sequence is converging to zero. And I pick an epsilon greater than zero. So let me put this as epsilon this is my epsilon. So what is my n epsilon here? My n epsilon is 5. Okay, because if I look at any, the entire tail of the sequence, so x5, x6, x7, x8, x9, x10 and all that, all of that is within the epsilon ball of the limit point, which is 0. Okay. So there are multiple ways to visualize this. 
this particular statement. In this way, you can only look at a scalar. Uh, so, so the x-axis here is the set of natural numbers. So we look at x1, x2, x3, x4. The other way to think about it is if you look at only a two-dimensional system, so this is my x1, x3, x5. And this might be my limit point. This is my x. I draw a ball of radius epsilon. Then x8 onwards, all the other elements of the sequence are inside this ball, epsilon ball around x. So it's the same thing. We, these both are the same representation, except that in this case, you are actually looking at it from here. In this case, you are stretching it out, and then you are looking at it from uh, where, where n is the x-axis. And this is a mathematical way of representing it. So you can imagine it in one dimension and two dimension. This one holds for all dimensions. So even if you have a million dimensional, uh, million dimensional x, this statement would still hold. <clears throat> all of you must be familiar with LLMs, and all of you are familiar with OpenAI, ChatGPT, and all that. How many dimensions do they have? When they are training the LLM, how many dimensions do you think they have? How, sorry? Billions of billions. Billions, yeah. It's more than billions, actually. Uh, I don't know whether it's 300 billion or whatever is the latest number, but it's of the order of trillion. OK, so this n, this n is of the order of trillion in the case of chat GPT and stable diffusion and so on, all these different LLMs. OK? So you can imagine in one and two dimensions. You can't imagine in trillion dimension. But this one works in trillion dimensions also. And this one also works in trillion dimensions. OK? So what is Cauchy sequence saying? Cauchy sequence is saying that I look at any two points in the tail of the sequence. So this is the tail of the sequence. I look at any two points in the tail of the sequence, and it's still less than epsilon. The distance is less than epsilon. Is that condition true here? So I look at the tail of the sequence. Let's say I look at x5 onwards. And I look at any two points, x5 and xx, xx and x7 x7 and x8, are the distances between these two shrinking over time? Right? Same thing happens here as well. If I look at the tail of the sequence and I look at the distance between any two points in the tail, it's small, right? And it becomes smaller and smaller as I go farther and farther in the tail, as I start looking at, looking at farther and farther side of the set of natural numbers. OK, so that's the definition of Cauchy sequence. Yeah. So that statement is only for like, the tail? This is only for the tail. Okay. But we are not, see, we are not talking about the limit point, x. So we are not saying that xk converges to x. We are just saying, let's look at the tail of a sequence. And if the tail is close together, then it's a Cauchy sequence. That's it. Yeah. So one question about this particular sequence. So even though in a, after every point after x5, it falls under the magnitude of epsilon. But the definition of Cauchy sequence, suppose say x6 is above the origin and right. x7 is below the origin. In right. that case, x6 minus x7's magnitude may not be less than epsilon, right? Uh, right, but if you go further and further in the sequence, you might be able to find at least one tail where it is below is epsilon, where but, the distance. But the, but the cutting point that. Mm, but the cutting point is like H, H5, right? The so cutting point depends on the epsilon. So if you pick a very small value of epsilon, the cutting point would be very, very large. OK? So if your epsilon is 0 0.1, you might, your n epsilon might be 5. Your epsilon is 0 0.01, your n epsilon could be, I don't know, 1 billion, right? So n epsilon doesn't have to scale linearly with epsilon. It can scale superlinearly. It can scale exponentially with epsilon, or 1 over epsilon. OK. So this is the definition of Cauchy sequence. Uh, 
do you think that when chat gpt is being trained or when llms are being trained or when machine learning models or any other optimization algorithm is applied to a problem is it easier to check this or is it easier to check this condition Cauchy sequence condition. So you look at successive iterates coming out of it, coming out of your algorithm, and you say, oh, I think these two are close together. And I look at the next sequence, next point in the sequence, and I say, oh, it's also very close to each other. So all of these values are close to each other. So it's very easy to check this. And then a cool mathematical fact is Cauchy sequence. converges. Okay, so if you pick a Cauchy sequence in Rn, in a finite dimensional Euclidean space, it always converges. And it converges to a limit point, x, and x is typically the point we are looking for. <coughs> Yes. That's also true in Rn, actually, yeah. So Cauchy sequence converges, and convergent sequences are Cauchy. Actually, proving this part is very easy, because xk minus xm is less than or equal to xk minus x plus x minus xm. And both of them are in the tail, so both of them are less than epsilon. So you know you can easily prove this part. But the opposite part is where it takes a lot more effort and work to prove. Yes? Is that XM like the, I think you mentioned it, is XM like the previous data point? No. So each k and m, both of them are in the tail of the sequence, so they are both greater than n epsilon. So I can pick, so if go, going back to this particular example, I can pick x5, and this is my x100, I can pick x100. As long as it's greater than 5, I, can, I cannot take x5 and x4, because 4 is not greater than n epsilon. So I pick any two points in the tail, I can pick x5 and x100, I can pick x9 and x1 billion. Even then, this particular condition must be true in a Cauchy sequence. OK. Any other question? OK, so now you understand why we are studying this stuff. We are studying it because in optimization, we almost always can only check for Cauchy sequence because we cannot wait until the end of the universe for the algorithm to converge. Um, for doing infinite iterations, you might, you require infinite time, right? So we don't have infinite time. We all have work to do. So, so Cauchy sequence comes to our rescue. Okay. Uh, now I'll talk about another, uh, limiting behavior of sequences, but only sequences in R. So I have xk. This is a sequence in R. So I have only one dimensional objects. I can define a new sequence, ym, which is
Okay. So I have a sequence which is a set of scalars. I now construct two new sequences. The first sequence is I look at the tail. So ym, I look at the tail, so all the points beyond m. And I take the maximum value. The supremum, supremum means like, I don't know how many of you are familiar with supremum, but you can think of supremum as maximum. Uh, I can't get into the more technical definition of supremum in today's class. So supremum is almost like whatever is the maximum value you can find in that particular tail. Um, infimum is what is the minimum value you can find in the tail of the sequence. So I pick the maximum value and then I pick the minimum value. It turns out that this ym converges to y and this zm will always converge to z, always. Okay. There are some mathematical properties of these sequences because of which it will always converge to y and z. Of course, in some cases y and z could be infinity, but we won't be interested in those situations. So we'll just assume that this is a bounded sequence. So ym is also bounded, zm is also bounded. So we're not looking at the cases where they are going to plus infinity or minus infinity. Sorry? So I'm just saying that they are the limit points of ym and zm. So you get a new sequence, right? This new sequence has a limit point. It has a limit. Just like we say xk converges to x, this ym would converge to some y. We don't know what that y is, but it will converge to some value. Okay, and same thing with zm. Zm will converge to some value, we are calling it z. We don't know what that value is, but there will be a value z with which, to which it will converge. This particular new sequence is going to converge. Let's look at a picture. This is my r, this is my n. Uh, on. So this is my x1, x2, x3, and so on. So what will be y1? Uh, let me give it some numbers. So this is 1, this is 0, this is minus 1. What is y1? So I look at the maximum value of all x where, I mean for, for all xk where k is greater than or equal to 1. So I look at x1 and I look at the maximum value for all the values that comes after x1, comes up th at the tail. What is the value y1? It's 1. What about y2? So I look at x2 and I look at the maximum value. So maximum value is these values, so this is also 1. y3 is equal to 1 and so on. So this y is actually equal to 1 in this case. Let's do the same thing with z z1. What is z1? So z1 is the minimum value of the entire tail after x1. So the minimum value is these values. So z1 equals to minus 1. What about z2? I look at the entire sequence after x2 and I look at the minimum value. So the minimum value is always minus 1. So this is minus 1 and so on. And so z here is also equal to minus 1. Not also, z is equal to minus 1. What this points to is you have a sequence, a scalar sequence. Uh, you look at this new sequences that you have constructed and as long as the original sequence is bounded, the new sequences will always have some convergent point. It will converge to a certain point. So this limit 
is known as limb soup and this limit is known as limb end. So limb soup of xk, k goes to infinity, maybe I'll write it somewhere else. That's the definition of limb soup and limb end. Yes. Sorry? No, no. It holds for any bounded sequence. So, in fact, the sequence doesn't have to be bounded. So, you pick a sequence, a sequence which is all scalar. So, all xk is, each of these xk is a real number. And you look at these two sequences, these two sequences will surely converge. It might converge or it I mean, I'm saying converge, but it might go to infinity or minus infinity, but it will go to some limit. Now, of course, we are looking at bounded sequences. We're not going to look at the, the case of unbounded sequences where things are going to plus infinity or minus infinity. Um, so as long as the sequence is bounded, it will converge to some value which is also bounded. And we call that particular value limb soup and limb inf. Okay, so every scalar sequence will have a limb soup and limb inf. It's just that whether those limb soup and limb inf is infinity or not infinity is the only thing we need to be careful about. When the sequence xk is convergent, then limb soup and limb inf will be the same value it will be the limit of that particular sequence. So if xk converges to x, then limb in xk equals to limb soup xk equals to x. So limb in and limb soup, they are the same value a convergent sequence. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Yes, k has to be greater than m. We are looking at the tail of the sequence xk. So we pick an m, then we look at the tail of the sequence. We look at all the xk such that k is greater than or equal to m, and we'll take the maximum value of that particular uh, tail. The next topic I want to talk about is subsequence. So subsequence is basically a subset of a sequence, but it also is an infinite subset of a sequence. So I have x1, x2, x3, and so on. A subsequence is denoted by xkl. L goes from 1 to infinity. and one of the subsequence could be x5, x100, x150, x250, and so on. So 
So we extract a subset of this particular sequence and that's called a subsequence. This is of course true for all, all spaces, sequences in all spaces. So you can always extract a subsequence from any sequence. And one cool fact every bounded sequence in Rn has a convergent subsequence. So I pick a sequence, a bounded sequence in Rn, so all the points are bounded, all the points are within a ball. I can pick a very large ball, but all the points should be within that ball. So it's a bounded sequence, and every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. So I can always extract a subsequence that converges to something, as long as the original sequence is bounded. Let's look at this particular diagram, this figure. Can someone extract a convergent subsequence out of this particular sequence that I've drawn? Correct. So that's a convergent subsequence. There are many more convergent subsequences. Someone else wants to come up with a different convergent subsequence? X1, X3, X4, X3, X3. So you started with X1? One through Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's also a convergent uh, subsequence. Any other? 159. 159, sure. This one is a convergent subsequence. Just look at x1, x5, x9. And then same thing, x3, x7, x11. These are all convergent subsequences. So in this case, it's a bounded sequence because x1, like the entire sequence is between minus 1 and 1, so it's a bounded sequence. And it has multiple convergent subsequences. And it has three limit points. Limit points is uh, whenever you look at all the convergent subsequences of a sequence, what are the points at which they are converging? So in this case, there are three limit points, 1, 0, and minus 1. Because no matter what convergent subsequence you pick, they are actually going to converge to one of these three points. OK? I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about sequences. So we'll move on to closed set and open set. We'll just introduce them. I'm sure you are all familiar with closed and open sets. Uh, but I want to pause here for any question before I erase everything from the board. Yes? It might be a dumb question, but a subsequence still maintains the order of this sequence, right? Uh, yeah, so it has to be in the increasing order. Yeah. yeah. That's why I explicitly wrote it, because it's not very clear from this writing KL. So in fact, uh, yeah, the way to explicitly write it is k1 must be less than k2 must be less than k3 must be less than and so on. It can't be equal to. So you can't have x1, 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 x1. It has to be x1, and then it has to be something greater than 2. M and, M and N, both of them should be greater than N epsilon. But should M also be greater than No, that's not a requirement. What do you mean? Like the difference keeps getting smaller as well. Correct, correct. But the K and M don't have any correlation. You can have it either way. K could be larger, K could be smaller, that's fine. As long as both of them are greater than N epsilon. Condition that 
Yes, it is. It is. Um, so, you know, I know that uh, this is not a course on infinite dimensional optimization, but if you take a course on infinite dimensional optimization, uh, you worry about Cauchy sequences all the time. Because in, in higher dimension, I mean, high, by higher dimensions, what I mean when n is infinity, right? So, in those dimensions, there are Cauchy sequences that do not converge to a limit point or it converges to a limit point which is outside the set. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I don't want to waste too much time here. Uh, let's say you are looking at a function, x raised to n, x is between zero and one. So this particular function, is it continuous function? Right, so for every n, this is a continuous function. Uh, so you have a sequence of functions f1, f2, and so on. You get a sequence of function. Each of these are continuous functions. What's the limiting function here? The limiting function is it's 0 everywhere except at x equals to 1, where it is equal to 1. Because when x is equal to 1, 1 raised to n is always 1. So in the limit, you have continuous functions. It's all a Cauchy sequence. In the limit, what you have is a discontinuous function. So it's no longer a continuous function. So people worry about it a lot in infinite dimensional systems. But here, we don't worry about it because we are always talking about finite dimensional. So LLMs are big. LLMs have trillions of parameters. LLMs are trillion dimensional objects. But still, they are finite dimensional. So we don't have to worry about it. But this is something people worry about, and that's why we study Cauchy sequence in great details in optimization. Um, any other question? No? Awesome. So we'll talk about closed set and open set. So let's say C is a set in Rn, U is a set in Rn. When do we say that C is closed? I'm sure you have seen this definition before. What's a closed set? So any scalar plus C is inside C and C any any combinations in C is still inside C. And that's a definition of convex set, not closed set. Okay. okay, so what is the definition of an open set? U is open if and only if for every x in U. Yeah. Yeah, the neighborhood of x is inside u. So how do I write it? There exists y, not there exists y. Uh, for every x in u, there exists epsilon greater than 0, such that The set of all y such that x minus y is less than epsilon is a subset of u. So let me draw a ball. This is not a ball, but this is some shape, some set. This is my set U. The boundary doesn't belong to U. Only the interior of the set belongs to U. I pick a point X. I look at the ball 
of radius epsilon around x, I can always pick an epsilon greater than 0 such that the entire ball of radius epsilon around x is within u. So I'll pick epsilon to be this big. And I look at this ball. This is uh, this ball is of radius epsilon, and that is within u. It's all contained within u. And no matter where with, where you pick an x, I can always find a ball. It might be very small ball, but there will be a ball which will be within u. So then it's the set is called an open set. Sorry. Uh, y is just a placeholder. It's all the points within the ball. So this is Y. So no matter what point you pick within this ball, I'll refer to it as Y. And all those points Y are within the set U. It's not outside. It's not going outside the set U. Okay? This is a subset of U. C is closed if C complement is open. Okay. So typically examples of open sets are, let me write a few examples. So let's say I'm looking at R. So if U is 0, 1, the boundaries are not included. It's an open set. This is a closed set because the boundaries are included. OK? So this is what you would have studied in the calculus class. So this is an open set. This is a closed set. This is the formal definition of open and closed set when x could be any dimensional. Okay? X could be millions of dimensional big, but that definition still works. Any question? Yes, please. So is a closed set everything that's in Yes. Uh, so the closed set would be, like if I include this whole boundary, that becomes a closed set. Okay, so I guess this would look something like this. That would be a closed set. So everything inside it is part of C. In the case of U, everything inside it is part of U, but the boundary is not part of U. So whenever we are talking about open sets, the boundary is not included in the open set. Whenever we are talking about closed set, the boundaries are always included in the closed set. Why do we care about closed set and open set in optimization? What is the cool property of a closed set? Any thoughts? What is the cool property of this particular set? Yeah, so boundary is included. So what does that imply? Uh, t keep your, uh, remember about sequences. Yes, yes. So closed set contains all the limit points. Uh, sorry, uh, if, if you have a sequence in a closed set, and the sequence has a limit point, then that limit point will also lie in the closed set. Let me give you an example. I have xk equals to 1 over k. What is the limit point here? This converges to 0, right? This entire sequence is contained in u as well as c, OK? But the limit is only contained in c. It's not contained in u, OK? So whenever we pick a sequence and we have a closed set, we know that if the sequence converges to a limit point, it will lie within this particular set. 
The reason why we care about it in optimization is suppose we have some constraints on the optimization variable. So I want my x to lie in certain set. Let's say that set is open and our algorithm converges to a solution. How do we know that that solution is within this set or not? Okay. So we always want to make sure that we pick a closed set so that if the optimization algorithm converges, it converges to a point within this closed set. Um, right. So I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say you are in charge of optimizing the powertrain of a vehicle, and you need to decide how the power needs to be split between a battery, which is like a, in a hybrid vehicle, you always have to decide how much, to go, how much energy should come out of the battery and how much energy should come out of the engine. And so you have to do the optimization of how much energy should come out of the battery and how much energy should come out of the engine. And you have some current constraints on the battery. So the battery can only provide at most this much amount of current, this much ampere of current. Now, if you set up the optimization in a way that you say, okay, the current has to be between zero and, I don't know, one ampere, and you make it an open set, and you give this problem to the optimization solver, the solver will return an error saying that, well, let's say the, sol the, the optimal solution was one ampere. The solver will always converse to one ampere and then say, look, one ampere is not part of the constraint, so therefore the problem cannot be solved. So you always have to make sure that you include the boundary so that the optimization solution, when, when the optimization uh, gives out a solution, it knows that, okay, the solution satisfies all the constraint that you have Im imposed on that particular problem. Okay, so that's why we always have to be worried about uh, using closed set when we are talking about optimization. Yeah. Say if one is like a dangerous. Sorry. Uh, so in this uh, example, uh -huh. uh, like the maximum one amp, the maximum current is one amp, but like that one amp is kind of dangerous to battery. So do you also include that? When you make this if it degrades the battery? Yeah. Um, that's a more complicated question. Uh, so you are going into what is known as. Uh, can you give short-term performance with long-term degradation, or you want long-term? benefit at the expense of short-term degraded performance. Yeah. So that's a design decision that the company needs to make when they are building the car. I'll give you a simple example. Tesla always, um, so, so if you look at Tesla's marketing material, they'll say it goes from zero to 60 miles per hour in two, two and a half seconds, whatever, some obscenely low number of seconds. It can go from zero to full speed. And then it also allows you to charge your car on supercharger network, which goes from zero to 80% SOC in, I don't know, half an hour or 45 minutes, or whatever their marketing collateral says, right? So, but if you look at it from the point of view of batteries, it's actually both these things are bad for the batteries, okay? Uniformly, they are bad for the batteries. So you don't want to use your car only on supercharger network. Slow charging is always better for electric vehicles. And you don't want to speed up from zero to 60 miles per hour in two seconds or two and a half seconds. You always want to gradually increase your speed. So, but that's a design, design decision that Tesla made early on. And they are selling a lot of cars now. So I guess they were successful. <laughs> but I, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is it's always a design decision. And depending on which market you are trying to serve, you need to figure out what what's the decision for your company or for your product is going to be. Uh, I'll give you another example. GE uh, runs a lot of wind farms across the US. And you know, because of the wind, uh, because of the velocity of the wind fluctuates over time, their wind uh, turbines get a lot of fatigue. You know, fatigue means like they, they become uh, weak over time. They have internal fractures over time. So they always have to figure out how to control the wind turbine so that the lifespan of the turbine is very, very large because changing each turbine is going to be very costly. They, they put like turbines in the ocean, 
let's say 30 feet turbine in the ocean, if they have to replace it every three years, it's going to become a big challenge. Uh, on the other hand, if they can maintain it for 10 years, it's a great thing for GE. So it's a design decision that GE has to make, whether they want to replace it every year or they want to keep it for 10 years. And then they'll design their algorithms accordingly. Yes, please. Correct. Correct. That's right. And how yeah, does this definition not fit when you're defining the closest? Uh, so I'm, I'm here at the boundary. No matter how small of a ball I pick, part of the ball is always going to be outside the set. Kind of, sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy way to remember. Uh, but this is the mathematical way to represent that intuition. OK, any other question? Yes, yes. And in the closed set, you can always find a point on the boundary and you create an open ball around it. That ball will always lie outside of the set. Yes, please. What is the meaning of a set that's part open and part closed? Uh, we don't worry about it in optimization, but uh, those are uh, like, I don't know, they call it clopen set or whatever. Uh, uh, something like this. Uh, we don't worry about it in optimization because this leads to issues when the solver is trying to solve it and it converges to one, then what is, supposed, what is one supposed to be? Is it part of the set, not part of the set? So we always work with this kind of constraint. Yes. Uh, sorry? Uh, see, uh, you don't call, so limit points is a function of a sequence, not of a set. The only thing that I'm saying is if you have a sequence within a closed set, then the limit points of that sequence will lie within that set. Okay, and that's, this is the example. So I have a sequence, it's part of both U and C. But the limit point is only contained in C, it's not contained in U. Okay, I can come up with another such example. 1 minus 1 over k. This converges to 1. Again, this entire sequence is both in U and C, but the limit point contained only in C. It's not contained in U. Okay. So I think we are... Uh, what is the time we are supposed to end? 12.30, 1.35, right? Okay, so we are at the end of this particular lecture. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about continuous functions. And after talking about continuous functions, we talk about differentiability, we talk about chain rule. And after that, we'll talk about uh, matrices. Okay, thank you so much.